Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Anantara Golden Triangle, my, our host hotel up here in the lovely Elephant Bar and the Golden Triangle Asian Elephant Foundation Elephant Professional Lecture. We are joined today by, um, for the first time actually, two different places uh, from New York City, I believe, and from California, Sarah and Sasha, talking about data that is gathered in Thailand, a truly international project, this one, and one I'm proud to say that uh, we do help we do help sponsor and we do help look, look at. Um, the aim of the project, and I'm not going to steal too much, is to have a look, Sarah and Sasha are looking at elephants in the middle of a protected area in Thailand and trying to see if they can, first of all, identify the elephants, which they can do very successfully. I'm sure they'll tell you how. Um, and then try and see if the elephant behavior and also elephant curiosity, if one way to put it, I'm sure it's not the scientific way of putting it, is a is a an indicator of whether the elephants will uh, will go and raid crops or do anything else in in the wild, and also if the more we learn about their behavior, is is how better can we protect them in the wild and keep them in the wild? Um, that's what I think the project's doing, and that's what I think I, I I send a little bit of cash to 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 help the help the rangers and the team collect the data and send the data all the way around the world by the magic of um, all of these, these bits of technology that we have nowadays for Sarah and Sasha to, uh, to have a look and to pass through and, well, discover what they discover and to know what they're discovering, um, we better talk to them. So without further ado, I will hand you over to, I think Sarah is going to go first and she will walk you through what the project means to them and, and whether I've got it right or not. <laughs> okay, hi Sarah. Hi John, thanks. Okay. Um, so again, I'm Sarah Jacobson. Um, I'm a PhD student at the CUNY Graduate Center. And I'm Sasha Montero, uh, a master's student at Hunter College. And uh, we'll be talking today about some of the research that we're involved in uh, that helps answer the question, do elephants have personalities like us? And how understanding uh, elephant behavior could help us prevent human-elephant conflict. So to start off, um, we are both part of the Comparative Cognition for Conservation Lab, uh, which is run by Dr. Josh Plotnick at Hunter College. And uh, as the name of the lab suggests, we, our lab is interested in studying cognition across species, um, looking at the evolution of certain cognitive abilities but we're also interested in how to apply animal behavior and cognition to conservation. So um, that's what I'm gonna be uh, focusing a little bit more on today um, with our wild elephant project in Thailand. And there are a lot of pe different people working on this project. So first of all, the students in our lab, some of which you can see in this left um, side photo here when um, some got a chance to visit the field site in Thailand and our excellent past and present research teams in Thailand uh, and the rangers that are working in Salak Pra Wildlife Sanctuary where our field site is, which you can see on the right here. Um, and then of course the local farmers that we also work with, um, which I will talk about a little bit more later on. And I definitely want to thank John and the Golden Triangle Asian Elephant Foundation for supporting our project because um, we want to be able to do it without you. So where are these wild elephants that we're studying? Um, we are working in the Kanchanaburi province in Western Thailand. And you can see in this map here, uh, the green outline is Salak Pra Wildlife Sanctuary, which is where the population of elephants that we're looking at um, live. And in this zoomed in version of our wildlife sanctuary here, um, you can see the four main sites where we are studying the wild elephants. So there are two sites within um, Salak Pra, Gangkep, and Kausa, and then there are two sites on the edge of the boundary um, in some of the local villages where there are um, agricultural fields as well. So Maple Soy in the north and Tamanau in the south. And what you'll also notice when you're looking at this map is that, you know, while it's very green inside um, the wildlife sanctuary and being a wildlife sanctuary, it's um, in Thailand, it's actually um, closed to the public. So um, the uh, animals within that area are relatively undisturbed. 
Um, along the edges are where you see this brown color, which um, is where all the agriculture is. So completely surrounding the wildlife sanctuary are um, different crop fields, mainly a lot of cash crops in that area. And because this farmland is so close to the protected land, um, elephants can easily just leave the um, protected area and come and snack on um, local people's crops, which can create a pretty big issue. Um, and this is where we have human elephant conflict in this landscape. Uh, so we're interested in, you know, looking into this issue of uh, human elephant conflict and the, the farmers in the area have tried a number of different strategies to try to keep elephants out of the crops. Um, you can see this photo on the top left here is a trench that was dug to keep them out. Um, the photo on the right is a sort of trip wire that's connected to these cans, which would make a really loud noise um, when an elephant tries to pass through, which potentially could scare the elephant, but um, more likely will just notify uh, the farmers that are guarding their crops that something is over there. Um, but the electric fences that many farmers also employ look somewhat similar to this. So a single wire that separates the crops from the forest and the surrounding area. The bottom two photos are also examples of how um, the farmers might actually try to get elephants that come into their crops out. So some of these strategies um, involve light, involve sound, um, so you can see this sort of pink, little bit blurry photo. There's a, uh, a truck here and they're using a big spotlight to try to scare an elephant away um, so that they'll leave. And then um, oftentimes the farmers will also use these firecrackers to throw above the elephant's head to scare them away. Um, so although these strategies may work for, you know, a couple days or maybe a couple hours, um, they aren't permanently keeping elephants out of the crops. So the elephants still want the sugar cane, want this um, cassava enough that they're going to get around these barriers or deal with the sort of annoyance of um, farmers trying to chase them away. And what this means is basically um, the local farmers have to spend most of their nights guarding their fields. So after they're working their fields, they're also staying up <laughs> for most of the night trying to keep the elephants out. And this leads to a lot of tension between the people um, and, the, and the wildlife. So we really want to try to come up with some, some better strategies ultimately um, that can work towards preventing this conflict. But um, since we're interested in cognition and behavior, our, the way that we're sort of um, approaching this question is from the elephant perspective. And using this perspective, we're interested in asking what are the characteristics of crop breeding elephants as compo uh, compared to those that stay in the protected areas. So these elephants you see on this left photo here that are in a cassava crop, what um, makes them different and willing to take the risk to come in contact with humans um, from this individual who's spending the time and the watering hole uh, within Solid Craw Wildlife Sanctuary. And other people have um, investigated this question in Asian and African elephants looking at sort of demographics. So is it mainly males or mainly females that are going into the crops? Um, and then what age classes are going into the crops. But really what we're interested in is going even deeper and saying, who are these elephants specifically um, who are taking this risk? Um, and what are the behavioral characteristics that might separate them from other elephants? And then also maybe uh, what are their associations, social associations with other elephants as well? And even within the elephants that go into the farmer's crops, um, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, there might be differences in their individual's behavior and how they respond to some of these deterrents that the farmers use too. So how are we researching these elephants? Um, how are we collecting this data? 
There are a couple different methods. Um, one is using watchtowers. So the top two photos here on the slide are some of the watchtowers that we use. Um, one, this uh, one on the left is at a crop field and this one on the right is in the protected area. And our research team will spend nights in these towers waiting until they hear an elephant or spot an elephant and then try to collect you know, as much video data as possible about what that elephant is doing. And we use some, um, some night vision, some like uh, thermal imaging and some infrared flashlights to try to get, um, you know, as much of an eye on these elephants as we can in the dark, which can be really challenging. Um, but what we're really interested in, especially in the crop fields, is what are the interactions between the elephants and the farmers? So again, getting that behavior um, between these, these individuals and seeing how they might differ in those interactions. So we get a lot of good data that way, but we also um, are collecting a lot of data using these camera traps, which are these um, devices you see here. And they are motion activated and record video. So we're able to collect behavioral data that way from these sort of stationary cameras that are usually placed on trees around our four sites. And I'll show you what that looks like here. Um, on the left, we have one of our watering holes and you can see the red symbols are camera traps and they're all facing different angles, uh, trying to get as many of the um, sort of views of the watering hole as we can. And these um, symbols with the elephant and the arrows are showing the elephant paths. So we've tried to place them along the paths so we can get that entry and exit from the watering hole. And um, in the right hand corner here is uh, one of the observation towers. The other image on the right is a map of Tamanau crop field, and we have six cameras deployed there. So again, similar idea, we're putting these cameras along um, elephant paths that um, where we think that elephants are entering and exiting crop fields. Um, and then the blue symbols uh, show the towers where both we observe elephants and the farmers guard the crops there. So our camera traps are able to give us some really high quality video like this. Um, and I'll just let you enjoy some of this, this elephant behavior at a watering hole. Some pretty typical bathing behavior, dust bathing behavior, drinking. You see a little bit of social behavior, a really cute infant right here on the right. And so especially during the daytime, we're able to get um, quite a bit of good um, detailed behavioral data this way. But even at night, um, we also have pretty good, uh, although it's not as fine detailed observations. And this is a crop field. So you can see this male approaching a fence and he touches the wire briefly, but then you can see him actually step on the fence post rather than getting shocked by the wire. Hopefully it's not too um, choppy for you here, but um, he pushes that fence post over and then is able to reach the sugar cane. So it's observations like these, looking at individuals actually getting around barriers that are put in front of them um, and navigating these fences that have gotten us even more interested in the individual. So what makes this male um, able to figure out how to get around the electric wire, whereas other elephants might just, you know, be scared off just by the wire being there. And I'll show you um, another video of some of the observation from the tower. So this is using a low light camera and some infrared flashlights. Um, but you can also see the flashlight coming, the light coming this way towards the back of the elephant is actually from one of the farmer's trucks. Um, and although he's walking a little bit and you'll see him actually start to, to run a little bit, he doesn't quite retreat into the forest. Um, so there is some movement here and there might be more of a retreat with this individual than others. 
but there are also other elephants that would very quickly retreat into the forest. So again, we're interested in these individual differences there. Um, so using all of this video data from the camera traps and from the, um, the tower observations, we not only can we look at the patterns of behavior between locations, so between the individuals at the watering holes and the ones in the crop fields, but we can also, um, you know, as I've mentioned again and again, really look into the differences in individual elephants and how they behave. But to really understand that, we first need some really important information um, that Sasha will actually introduce. Thank you, Sarah. So before I begin explaining my IDing process, I just want to say that it can be especially difficult to tell elephants apart from one another. Um, as you can see on the screen, elephants don't have a distinct coat pattern, much like tigers do, uh, making this process a lot harder when looking through videos um, of stationary camera traps, which Sarah mentioned earlier. Um, for example, researchers typically look at the stripe patterns on their coat and specifically around their face of the tigers. And once they identify that pattern, they can ID that tiger. However, with elephants, since they don't have a distinct coat pattern like that, we have to look much deeper and have a thorough 360 view of the elephants to really capture as much data as we can. Um, for those reasons, in this study, we aim to refine methodologies for identifying individual elephants from both daytime photos and videos, as well as potentially uh, creating a framework for nighttime videos. Um, because it is especially difficult, as you'll see, um, to identify elephants depending on the um, visibility of in light, the distance the elephants are away from the camera, and things like that. So, this study is also a first step towards a systematic way of IDing elephants um, in our population. As you see on the screen, we use a database to keep track of individuals, which we give specifics like their ID number. Uh, we provide some notes that are very telling of this individual, as well as um, th hopefully a 360 view screenshots in order to really see uh, the elephant in full, full view. And with all this information, we really hope to provide the rangers and the farmers we're working with with an ID guide to utilize while they are um, you know, in the fields or around the park and run into elephants so they can utilize that. Um, this is definitely not the first time that researchers have um, ID'd individuals in the wild. Um, however, um, they've had other resources to utilize to make it much easier than stationary camera traps. For example, some researchers use mobile vehicles to track and follow elephants to obtain more, a more well-rounded set of characteristic data. While again, we have those camera traps that are you know, set in a, in a tree at, at one angle, and that's the angle we have until we can go back into the field and, and change that. Um, what's really been helping um, us too is that there's been a previous study uh, back in 2015 that looked at the population composition of these elephants in the population, uh, and they specifically looked at age and sex. So this has given um, us a good foundation to work with and look forward to when we are using our characteristic data to ID the elephants. So as you see on the screen there, um, it's a figure of many different elephant ears. Um, if you've already noticed, there's, there's a wide variety of ears and they can look very different. Um, this is a big important characteristic and body part that I look at while identifying elephants in these camera trap videos um, to be able to tell them apart. Um, so as you can see, what really stands out to me is that um, if you see the top left corner, picture A and B, seem quite similar in shape. Uh, they, their earlobe seems a bit round on the bottom of the ear. Um, however, if you look closer, they have some differences. So when I first look at ears, I look at three different sections. Like I mentioned, I look at the earlobe, I look at the side fold, and I look at the top fold. So if I look at picture A first, I can see that that top fold is a forward rolling fold. So I would give that trait state to that characteristic that I'm looking at. I would then move down that ear and look at the fold there and notice that it is forward. So I would call that a forward side fold. 
And then again, like I mentioned at the beginning, I would go down to the earlobe and notice that it's rounded, so I would call that U rounded. So the difference uh, with that and the figure and the image B is that image B has a top flat fold, whereas it also has a backward side fold. So that's very different. And if you notice in the corner there, there's also a slight tear on that back fold. Um, so that could be very telling as well. So I, I also make a note of, of that later and use that as a characteristic as well to note where tears are around the ears and write notes for specifications about how many um, ears, how, uh, how many holes, how many tears there are along both ears. Um, and as you notice probably uh, from this image is that daytime and nighttime quality pictures can vary. Um, and that's why, like I said earlier, it can be very difficult to identify individuals um, and, and uh, distinguish them apart. So that is one important characteristic I use that's separated into three different parts. Um, and I also use tails, um, which are also big distinguishing factors. Uh, tail length, not only tail length, but tail brush, um, just because there's an abundance of variation through that. As you can see on the left, um, there is a full brush, I would say, you know, normal length. You can, vary, you can tell that it's dark, full, and, and black. Whereas, you know, if you go next to it, uh, to the right, it's very subtle, but it's still there. Um, and if you look down the line as well, there is variable. So the third one, there's no hair. The fourth one, there's an interior section of that hair length, but it might be shorter on the posterior uh, side of the tail um, and so on. So I really look at these two things in order to further help me distinguish them in the wild and when they're moving across the camera view. So now I'll go further into all that. So, so far we've been able to identify 103 individuals the majority have been adults, but it's still important to look at all the demographics and the composition of the population to learn more about their behaviors and movements. So on the screen, you'll see two screenshots of an adult female elephant with her offspring. As you can tell already that these, are, these pictures come from one day uh, view and one night view. Um, how did I tell her apart from all the others? Well, she has a noticeable ear tear on, the, on her right ear that can be noticed in both pictures here. Um, and I use 20, a total of 24 characteristics in, in my study in order to really distinguish them. And like I said, not only do I use ear characteristics, tail characteristics, and back shape, but I use how many tears, if they have deep pigmentation, um, which is the pink coloration all around their body, uh, primarily in their ears and their trunk, sometimes in the body. And also I take note if there are different um, bumps or lumps on them. So like warts or just bumps from bug bites and things like that to again, further be able to distinguish them apart. Um, so I, so for the next one, I, you know, did the same process. This is an adult male. Um, and the reason why I know it's an adult male is, first of all, he has tusks. So in Asian elephant species, uh, males predominantly have tusks, while females do not. They can have tushes, which are, is also ivory, but do, they do not grow to a great length, much like um, tusks do. And that is a very telling thing that I can use to identify the sex of the elephants, um, as well as if they're solitary or not, which I will go into further in the next slide. So for this um, elephant, I first looked at the ears after the tusks and noticed that it was the shape kind of fell through. So the top fold is pretty rolling. Um, even though it looks like these ears are, you know, forward and open, that's just because they're flapping. Um, in both pictures, um, so they are backward uh, side folds. But the very telling thing, again, like I mentioned in the previous one, is that tear um, on the uh, left ear. Um, and it's in, it's in both pictures. So again, that is very important to know, as well as the tusks and the tail. So the tail, uh, if you can see it, it's 
barely showing um, right there where the cursor is. So if you see there, you know, there's barely any hair there, but there's a few strands um, there. So that is very telling for this individual. So I will make note of that as well. And that way I can uh, continue to locate him throughout my videos and, you know, follow his movements and such like that. So this last example is also an adult male, um, but if you notice, he is tuskless. Um, so how do I know for sure that this is an adult male? Um, well, there are differences in the back shape, um, spe uh, more specifically in the rear. If you look at it through the back, back end, you can kind of see that shape. Also genitalia is very um, easy to see towards the back end. Um, however, and so that's what I really utilized to sex this elephant. And once I made sure that he was a male, I went further again to categorize him in all of my uh, 24 characteristics. Um, so I looked at his top folds. So they're there on the screen, forward rolling. Again, he had, um, on one end he had forward rolling and on the other end he had a forward flat. Um, so this combination is kind of unique as well. And so that is important to always uh, really look into each elephant to make sure that these subtle differences may not seem, you know, too uh, significant in this instance, but in the grand scheme, while I've uh, looked at so many elephants, that this is very important to know. And so it's been really uh, fun and important to uh, use all these characteristics to uh, ID them. And last but not least, something very exciting that I've been uh, looking at with Sarah here um, is that as we continue the process to ID, we can also uh, use these IDs to identify which individuals have been coming to Sarah's puzzle box, which she will go into further in just a minute. Um, but here are a few pictures of elephants that I had identified previously. And when going through them, I was able to um, see that they have been visiting her puzzle box as well. And specifically, if you look at the bottom right picture, that is the elephant I ID'd, you know, two slides over. So that's been really fun to really see um, and explore as well. Um, but without further ado, Sarah will take it away and finish up and tell you about her research. Thank you, Sasha. Um, so yeah, as uh, Sasha was talking about this ability to identify individuals um, using the database she has set up is going to be key for our future research. And in particular, it will allow us to really get into this question of personality. Um, so to be able to know a personality of an elephant, you have to know who that elephant is, of course, and be able to identify it across different um, videos. And when we're talking about uh, personality in animals, some, some people might actually be surprised uh, to hear us say that animals can have different personalities. I think um, we, we think often about the way humans have pretty complex personalities. Um, or, you know, maybe you're not surprised if you think about some different pets you've had and um, the sort of behavioral traits that define them. But when scientists are talking about personalities, we're really um, just talking about consistent behavior across time or context. So this is kind of similar to how we think about humans. Um, you might think of an extroverted person as consistently extroverted. Um, they're not, you know, super, super shy in one scenario and then very extroverted in another scenario. Uh, they're typically extroverted across all of these scenarios. So the same would apply to elephants. Um, you could determine whether a personality trait like uh, just being social, if an elephant is consistently social across a time or context. So um, in the traits that I'll talk about that we're interested in investigating uh, with this population, um, we, our ultimate goal is to look at these traits, you know, across multiple times and also across contexts. So as Sasha mentioned, um, one way that we are going to do this is using a puzzle box. Um, and so these are some photos of the puzzle box. It's basically three uh, metal compartments and each compartment has a different door. 
and inside the compartment is some juicy jackfruit, which smells really good to the elephants and um, is also very delicious. If you haven't had jackfruit, um, it, you should definitely try it sometime because you would understand why the elephants are trying to get into this box to get it out. Um, so to, to get a piece out, they have to actually open um, each of these compartments or, or at least one of the compartments. And the top here is a pull door. Uh, the middle is a slide door and the bottom is a push door. So each requires a different action to open it. And you can see this middle photo has um, the opened doors there. Um, so if you remember that video of the fence navigation, um, potentially some elephants just are more likely to solve these types of novel problems than others. And that's really what we're hoping to look at uh, with this puzzle box. And not only this ability to problem solve, but even how they approach something like this in their environment. So something bright, shiny, and new um, where they've never seen it before and how they um, are also maybe interacting with this puzzle box. Um, and specifically when we're looking at innovation, we would be looking at how many of the doors they're opening um, and also how quickly they're able to open this. So we would imagine that this differs across individual elephants um, and potentially this can also tell us something about the elephants that are navigating barriers um, in human areas as well. And we've already, you know, we've been collecting this data for a little bit and we have seen some differences in how elephants approach um, the puzzle box. This individual is being pretty cautious, um, approaching slowly and just lightly touching the box before walking away, not wanting anything to do with it. You can see the tail is out in a sort of anxious, um, excited behavioral state. Um, and so that's one, you know, sort of elephant that we've seen, but we've also seen quite a few elephants who are quickly approaching this box, who are really interested in interacting with it and have been able to actually open the doors and innovate um, even multiple times to open the doors. So we've seen um, a few now that have been able to actually get all of the doors open, which is super exciting. Um, and like this male <laughs> right here, who's reaching into um, a different configuration, but a top door here. So this is ongoing data collection um, that we are working on. And right now we just have the boxes at um, a watering hole within Salikpra, but we are hoping to expand um, to install them near the edge of the protected area. So um, we can potentially get some of those elephants that are leaving Salak Pra and going into the croplands um, and try to see if there are differences between those that are taking these risks and how they interact with this box and how they innovate um, compared to those that aren't. So that's um, one way that we're, we're currently looking into personality here. Another way that we can um, look at personality is by looking at um, social behavior. So we have now 300 or so hours of video of elephant behavior from our camera traps um, from about a year and a half of collecting um, video data from our camera traps. So we can look um, at traits like aggression potentially. And as long as we can identify the same elephant um, in multiple videos and maybe we can see that they're consistently aggressive towards other individuals, we can identify these types of traits. Um, and then from our tower observations, we can also see um, consistent, potentially consistent aggression towards people as well. Um, and besides aggression, we can just also look at sort of affiliative social behaviors and general sociability between elephants as well. So some, um, lastly, there are also some traits that we hope to experimentally assess in the future. Um, one of these, or two of these traits are neophilia and neophobia. So neophilia is the attraction towards novelty and neophobia is the fear of novelty. Um, and these traits are typically tested with different species using um, novel object tests. So a novel object is put into the environment and you see how an animal reacts to it. And we're especially interested in this trait because as you can see in this photo um, here of the elephant um, in India, this 
bull, this male elephant, is um, not, you know, they chose to go into this um, very urban area, and they must not be afraid of all the, you know, sort of novel um, things around them, like the cars, the motorcycles, the loud noises, um, or maybe they're also attracted to some of these um, novel things. And so potentially there is some relationship between this trait and the elephants that are going into human dominated areas. We're also interested in the trait of boldness. Um, and when we talk about boldness, we're particularly thinking about how different elephants react to predators. Um, so we are hoping to test this not by, you know, putting tigers in next to elephants, because that's not how we would want to do some, do this sort of test, but by actually um, maybe playing a sound of a tiger or a smell of a tiger, putting a smell of a tiger out there to see how different individuals react to this predator signal. Um, and you could also think of humans as being um, one of these predators. So looking at the differences in how elephants um, react to humans. And again, so this connection between maybe a bolder individual who's consistently bold in, across different times um, might be one who is more likely to go into human areas and take the risk um, and interact with humans. So, you know, again, all of this research into the individual is really, um, important for informing human elephant conflict mitigation because this is such a big issue um, in the landscape we're working in. And we are hoping that um, really our research into taking the elephant perspective and really getting into what makes these individuals different um, might be helpful in developing better strategies in the future. So we think that this research will help develop um, you know, conservationists and um, managers pot potentially to develop mitigation strategies that aren't only a barrier that keeps the elephant from the crop. So as we, you know, as we watched in that fence video, um, it's easy for an individual who might be more innovative to actually overcome a barrier. So if you're putting up a barrier, you're providing this opportunity um, for the individual to innovate and overcome it. Also, potentially, um, these fear-based tactics that are being used, um, like the light and the loud sounds, may not have as great of an effect on a bold um, elephant who is also really, you know, attracted to novel things. So again, we would hope that um, our research might steer conservation uh, people and conservation away from developing strategies that are purely fear-based. And overall, this investigation into differences between individuals um, should help provide the, um, you know, the idea that one strategy of mitigation may not fit all elephants because we have a number of different personalities being represented um, within the population. So, um, so th this is our ultimate goal with this research, but you know, we're uh, in sort of the beginning stages and we have a lot of data left to collect. Um, so we hope that everyone will stay tuned and um, for our future research results. Uh, we, you can follow us on Facebook. We do have a Facebook page and we also have um, a website at ccconservation.org, um, which we regularly update. So um, if you're interested in learning more about the research that we continue doing, um, you can check that out there. And Sasha and I are happy to answer any questions that you might have about this work. Thank you very much, Sarah and Sasha. Um, so first of all, those of you on the Zoom, if you have any questions, please do unmute yourselves and, uh, and ask away. Anyone? Okay, seems good. You covered most of the base. Any, any, are there any questions from Facebook? Ooh. Um, yes, it's actually it's about uh, identifying the elephant. As um, Sasha mentioned, that many things that you know is make things very hard to identify. So they ask like, um, is there anything like you know like based on computer aid to identify the elephant, like such as like wild book or anything similar with that? 
Yeah, so um, that is probably the, and that is the goal. Um, right now, we're just starting out. Um, and I'm, you know, being the human test run, as I may say, is to IDing the elephants. That way, you know, in hopefully the near future, we could understand what we're supposed to tell the computer to be able to do um, and how the computer would be identifying elephants just like I am. Um, right now, I am just troubleshooting that and trying to figure that out myself. That way um, we can do that in the future. Yeah, we, um, okay. there are some, um, sorry, I was just gonna expand on that a little bit. Um, there have been some researchers that have done this sort of computer identification with African elephants. So we're really interested in whether that same algorithm could work with our, our population and hopefully we'll be able to work with them to, to try to get at that in the future. But we'd, we have to have Sasha's um, hard work to train any sort of computer algorithm to recognize that too. Okay, and since like you have 103 um, identified elephant, how many males and females? Um, so off the top of my head, I believe there are about 55 males and about 20 to 21 females so far, adults. Um, there are uh, juveniles and infants, um, but it's difficult to sex them at that young age. So um, we like to try to sex them as adults because it is easier. Um, so those are the numbers we have so far. And uh, from some research in the past, uh, it does seem like there are around 200 to 300, 250 to 300 elephants in the sanctuary. So uh, we still have some to go and we may not you know, get the whole population with where our camera traps are located because um, there is still you know, other parts of the sanctuary to cover. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to, you know, to at least identify 300 at some point. Okay, so does that mean you have elephants on film that you haven't identified yet, but perhaps because males are easier to identify from your record. or something like that than, than females? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've found it a bit difficult to um, ID the herds as a whole just because um, they get in the way of one another. Um, and sometimes the females may not have prominent tears or bumps or other traits like I've I've showed like I showed examples in the presentation. Um, so it does take me a bit longer to do that with the females, but um, hopefully in the near future I will be getting to them, and that way we just have a good number and some of the population. Um, may, may I have the question then uh, for the elephant that you I mean on your record. How about the size of the elephant herd? What is the smallest one that you see or what is the biggest one? Because I, I believe in each area, it de depends on how big of the forest or, you know, that fact. So maybe that would tell us a bit more about around that area. Yeah, that's so we are still working to um, code all of the video data that we have coming in. Um, so I can give you sort of a guesstimate of our, our largest herd, um, but that will be a, you know, a question we'll definitely answer in the future um, because we have students um, actually recording, you know, when they see the most elephants, how many are there. Um, but we've seen, you know, multiple herds coming together. And I, I want to say that there's been some groups that are around probably 40-ish. Um, but again, I don't have, you know, an exact number. And then, of course, we see a lot of lone bulls. So we do, and, and then sometimes we just see that, um, you know, mother with two offspring, that's a pretty common, um, site as well at some watering holes. So a mother and an infant, and then also some juvenile calf with her as well. So hopefully I'll be able to answer oh. that for fully in the future. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one question from James, like how widely do the elephant range in mm -hmm. the park around the area that you do the project? Yeah, that's, um, 
That's a great question. I, I hope that we will be able to really answer that, um, you know, as this project progresses. So we don't, we don't have any sort of um, like uh, GPS or any sort of radio collaring of these individuals in this location. Um, so really we're basing our information about where they're going um, on seeing them in a camera trap. And so um, right now where our camera traps are located are gonna sort of, you know, bias where we know elephants are. And eventually, hopefully we'd be able to also set up camera traps in other locations um, once we have maybe a bigger team um, or once we've really surveyed our current locations thoroughly. Um, so we don't we don't fully know and, and we hope that uh, through more camera trapping and maybe far in the future if we're able to ever ever collar these elephants we would get a better idea of that too. But not yet, we don't know. Okay, and that's related to a question I was going to ask as well, which is you said you were going to set up puzzle boxes closer to the edge of the park. Does that mean you haven't identified bulls in the center of the park around the watering holes where you have your watchtowers that have then gone on to crop raiding yet? And that's why you're having to move or have you identified bulls, I guess, or any, any elephants from the center of the park who have gone to the edge of the park and done some crop raiding as well? Um, so we haven't, um, like, I would say we don't have a full affirmative that an individual that we've seen at um, the watering hole is one that's crop breeding, but we've seen some very chunky males come to the, the watering holes. And often that is a sign that they're a crop breeder because they're eating this high calorie food like corn um, or high sugar like sugar cane. And I don't know if you noticed in that video of the, the male um, pushing down the fence, he was very heavy. <laughs> um, so, you know, that gives us maybe a sign that some are, are coming across the park, um, but we don't think all of them are because we have, at least from reports from the local farmers, um, they do seem to consistently see certain individuals that they have um, known for a long time. And um, it really seems like, you know, not all elephants are leaving the area, but there probably are some that are in both areas. And I don't know, Sasha, if that individual that you had ID'd, I, do you know if you have any videos of um, clips of him outside of the park off the top of your uh, head? No. So the, I know there's one, the Tusk male. No, he's he's traveled uh, throughout um, the sanctuary at two different sites. Um, I think there was one that we may have seen outside of the park, but not necessarily in the crop fields. Um, so I wouldn't fully understand what he'd be doing because I haven't seen him crop raid or anything. Yeah. Yeah, the camera traps give us a pretty selective view <laughs> of, of what's happening, um, which is, you know, can be um, a negative, but also is uh, able, we're able to collect all this passive data, which is really important, especially in a fa uh, pretty forested environment where you can't just drive around and find elephants. Okay, thank you very much. Anything else though, from the Facebook? Uh, yes, one question from Kylie. Can you determine the age of the elephants by observing their body size? Yes, you can. Um, we are, right now we are working on classifying them into rough age classes um, and we are using shoulder height, mainly relative shoulder height. So if we see an adult, we are looking at the others in the, in the group and then how that shoulder height of the others compare to the adult. Um, and there is a definitely a more detailed way of doing this. Um, you can actually get some measurements, um, like relative measurements, and um, look at you know the average height, shoulder height of a um, forty-year year old elephant compared to a twenty-year old elephant, and things like that. But we um, are not at that stage yet. Hopefully, again in the future, we'll be able to get more into those questions. 
and by then it'll of course be confounded by who goes crop raiding and who doesn't <laughs> because your your high nutrition at an early age may lead to a larger elephant <laughs> very good thank you sorry yeah, and that would be really interesting to look at <laughs> i think and what, one more question from me, like, what is the stage of the project now? Because, I mean, with COVID, everything seemed like hard than, you know, in the past. So can you update or share um, your current yeah. and what are, what are you doing for now? And what is the plan for, like, maybe for this year? Yeah. Um, luckily, we still have a research team um, out in the field, which is amazing. <laughs> They've been really great through, um, you know, the, the whole pandemic. Um, and they're able to continue collecting uh, the camera trap data. And they're also spending nights in the towers to collect that data as well. So, um, so we still have data coming in and we have a great team here in New York who are able to, you know, we can use thing, uh, things like Dropbox to share all these video files and then we can all work remotely to watch um, the videos of elephants. So it is really cool to sort of be connected by all of these <laughs> these videos traveling across um, the ocean. So right, you know, unfortunately, of course, I'm not there, which I would would have been this summer, which would have been really nice and this fall. But, um, you know, we'll be able to get back there in the future. And I think for now, we're just continuing to get as, you know, as much data as we can. If you absolutely need someone to go and stand in a watchtower or sit in a watchtower overnight and look at elephants, I, I will consider doing it for a very small fee and probably going to Allwood as well. Um, so there is always that. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, okay. if you ever want to stop in for someone on the research team. <laughs> we, I, we have two more questions. Um, sorry. One from Dr. Matana, like how often book group uh, Sorry again. How often will group and family group like great club comparing perspective? And how big bull group red crop solitary? How many individuals? Um, another great question. So we've I, I, we don't at this point have the numbers really uh, to summarize that unfortunately, but again, we will very soon as you know we get more and more of these videos coded um i'd say for for the bull groups in um that we're typically seeing in the crop fields um i've seen the most i've seen i think is four and it was a pretty interesting observation actually we saw a lot of um play behavior in one of the crop fields uh, where they were sort of on the edges and not really, you know, close enough that the farmers cared what they were doing. Um, so that was one of the more interesting observations, but there were actually, you know, quite a, a big group of, of bulls. Um, definitely most frequently we're seeing lone males. Um, and then we have in the crops fields, we have seen a few, um, uh, females with young as well. Um, so you'll have to stay tuned for those exact sort of like summary numbers about um, the groupings that we have. Okay, thank you. Last question from Facebook. <laughs> you are very popular today. Um, <laughs> I think uh, from James again, have you considered giving inexpensive cameras for the farmers to take a picture of, you know, the crop readers away from, you know, like, except from the camera trap from, I mean, from your camera trap and from your towers. So you could get more photos and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that's a good idea. We have, we have had some farmers that will just send us us and our team photos. So they happen to be um, close enough to snap a photo on their phone and they'll they'll share that with us, us which is really great. Um, typically, they're not getting, no one is getting close enough to get the kind of detail with the ears that, um, you know, as Sasha talked about, you really need to identify the full elephant, um, unless they have really distinctive characteristics. Um, but 
it would be it would be interesting to see um, we have some you know relatively less expensive cameras that that maybe we could we could share to get some more footage um, right now we have our team going into the crop fields pretty often um, but but that could help us get even more data so I'm yeah that's a great idea but quality as I'm sure data uh, as I'm sure Sasha can um, can expand on is really important. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as I shared the the figure of all the different years, you can tell, you know, if, if what pictures really washed out, if they captured it at night, um, it'd be hard to tell what elephant that is without any other information. Whereas, depending on where they are located in the crop field or if they're outside of it, uh, that could help or hinder it as well. Because if they're in the middle of the crop field and they snap a picture from above, it might be really hard to see all the features at once uh, and the ears even depending on how tall the crops are um, to really identify that elephant. So it really does vary with the distance and the daylight and um, the movement because also speed too. If they're walking away from you while you're snapping a picture, it'll be really difficult to capture them. Yeah, that's one benefit actually I think we've found with video is that um, we are able to sort of look at some of the movement of an individual, which can can tell us something about them rather than just that single feature. So those are some of the more like, we're not classifying them into categories, but uh, we might remember them and um, use that information. Yeah, and also, I guess you don't want to be encouraging people to get too close to take photographs of elephants because then opens up a whole new level of problem. Okay, and one yes. question from the Zoom group, actually, so you could ask yourself, but I'll ask it for you, Tanya. Um, what brand of camera were you using for your camera traps? We are using um, the um, Spec Ops, what is it? I'm blanking on the name, Browning, sorry. Browning Spec Ops is the name of the brand we're using. And um, they're really, they've been really great so far. We chose that brand because they had a very fast trigger speed. So um, so the video will, will record, we have it set to record for 20 seconds at a time. And then um, as soon as that 20 seconds is over, it'll take less than a second to start recording again. Um, if there's motion or some thermal, um, uh, energy in the field. Um, and so that was why we chose this camera because we wanted to get almost continuous video while the elephants are there. Um, and this seemed to provide a really, you know, uh, a great option for that. In general, camera traps are going to, sorry about the honking outside my <laughs> apartment. Um, camera traps do have you know, some issues, I think, no matter what type you get, um, especially being in the Thailand heat, um, they may not function as well as we would hope. And we'll have some gaps between video and you're like, an elephant definitely walked right this way because I see them before they were there and I see them after. Why did it not record as they passed? But they've been, you know, pretty good overall. Yeah, I thought the images on them were absolutely fantastic, having done a little bit of camera trapping myself. Were you yeah. using solar power? Sorry, say that again? Were they, were they solar powered? Oh, um, no, they are battery powered. So our team, besides changing SD cards, they're also changing batteries every time they're out there. Um, solar powered would be really great um, if, you know, we could get that going a uh, problem could be that the elephants you know do sometimes mess with these cameras and um if that's you know an expensive addition to make it solar powered that's something that you know we have to think about <laughs> um but yeah i would i would love if we could just have everything solar powered and not have to use all those batteries but yeah, hopefully in the future. great work guys it's awesome thank you thank you thank you Right, if that's it, I actually I have one more question for Sasha. Do you have a point in the ear flap where you recognize the back fold being front or forward because surely that changes during a flap or does it not? 
Um, well, so I typically uh, watch the whole video. So if they're walking and they're flapping their ears um, and there's a pause in the flapping, I could tell um, what, what folded, um, where it's folded. Um, typically, I, I, I see a good mix of both front views and back views of the elephants. So um, typically, if, they're, if I, they start off in the front view, and hopefully the camera is continuing recording. I'll see a back view eventually. So that could also verify if they're forward uh, side folds and back folds. Um, so yeah, that really helps. Thank you very much. So it ends one small part of a, a big picture as well. So you're using so many. And I, I like this when you, when you talk about sometimes it's the way they move. I can never identify elephants or very rarely identify elephants from stills. Although I think this is Manoy here. The team will tell me if I'm wrong or not. Um, there is something in the so I, I'm almost hoping that a computer algorithm can't define them because I like to think they're indefinable by a computer but I'm probably going to be proven wrong because computers are cleverer and cleverer nowadays with facial recognition and the like um, I always think there's something indefinable about, about each elephant but that's probably just me being an old romantic Anyway, if there are no more questions, thank you very very much um, for the talk also thank you very very much for the work and continuing the work and to the team here in Thailand, who I don't think signed on, but um, they're probably out in the field up in trees. In the field. Yeah. <laughs> As we speak, they're up in the trees. So fantastic work, everybody. And um, please don't forget to send me videos and stills when, when you can, because I, I love to see them and sometimes, and tell me if I can broadcast them on our page or not. Um, but fantastic, it, it's great to see. I mean, apart from anything else, it's always great to see. I know there's a deep scientific need for what you're doing. Um, and deep scientific, we, it really will help us protect elephants better, but there's always great to see such large herds of elephants living wild in the middle of the forest, um, being elephants as they have been for thousands of years. I know that they're probably not, they're slightly, slightly more confined than they were, but it's great to see that they still exist there and um, undoubtedly camera traps sit there that don't invade the elephant space at all are the best ways to do it even if every once in a while they do a little bit of work for you to get some jackfruit so fantastic work thank you very very much for for everything um and again even more thanks for for joining us and and, and giving us an insight so brilliant um so all that remains oh, you're very oh. i just said you're very welcome and we also thank you of course for again for your support um of our project yeah thank you so much so all that remains for me to say is um, to remind the sponsors, here we are in the Elephant Bar, which is, I suppose it's eight, nine o'clock in the morning, so we shouldn't have too many people in the bar, but it's, it's, we, could, we could use a few of you to come up and have a coffee if you're a Thai-based, and you can come and look at these elephants, this elephant here that's pictured, who are, who are unfortunately not wild elephants, but still we do have some behavior and we still have some things to go that you can watch as they, as they roam down on our very, very small plot of grassland here. Um, and if you'd like to, to learn less scientific things, but see more elephant behavior, uh, that then was just showed in the small or the small amount of video that the that Sarah and Sasha were allowed to sell us that uh, show us um, do join me every day for my live streams with the elephants uh, at 7 30 in the morning and 4 p.m. Thai time um, again nowhere near as scientific but we do have we can show you elephants all the time and I do go a little bit into how how I identify how I identify elephants which is a uh, is very close to Sasha, but Sasha's better at it than I am. And I could never do it from video. I have to be standing next to them to tell. Um, I got the wrong one for the for 20 minutes yesterday as well. <laughs> anyway, that's all, all that remains to be said. Thank you very, very much for watching everybody out there in Facebook land. Um, our next professional lecture will also be about wild elephants. It'll be about on five Thai wild elephants from two guys who are actually in the field almost every night, which will be a nanny and Andy from Nature Wildlife Association. And that will be at 5 p.m. Thai time next Wednesday um, until then or until four this afternoon or 7.30 tomorrow morning. If you want to join the live streams, they'll be live here on Facebook. Um, have a good day, everybody else. And um, yeah, enjoy yourselves. Thank you very much from Anantara Golden Triangle. We will see you all very soon. All right, thank you.